Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, my name is Ioana Sitaridou, and I'm the Deputy Director for the Cambridge Center for Greek Studies. I'm uh, delighted to welcome you all to what is promising to be a very exciting talk by a very prominent speaker today. Dr. Frank uh, Salmon is a university senior lecturer in the history of art, and he's a fellow of St. John's uh, College. I should also mention that Frank is the director of the newly founded Axon uh, Johnson Center for the study of classical architecture at Cambridge, uh, which sees the Department of History of Art partnering with the Department of Architecture and uh, the Faculty of Classics. So without uh, further ado, I would very much like to welcome Frank um, and uh, give him uh, the floor. Thank you very much indeed, Joanna, and um, thank you everybody for uh, coming to this, this talk for the Centre for Greek Studies um, on, a, on a, uh, an early evening. It's a, a great pleasure to, to be speaking on this subject. As Joanna just said, I'm actually working on something very different at the moment, but uh, Greece has never been very far from my mind in recent years, and the material I'm going to talk about tonight relates to perhaps a long-term book project. So I'm spinning some ideas tonight to see what uh, the audience think of them. I should be very glad to receive um, any uh, comments, advice, suggestions from you at the end. Um, and it's also nice to be speaking just as Joanna just said, we we'll just be able, be able to launch in Cambridge the Axon Johnson Centre for the Study of Classical Architecture, uh, a, a new uh, initiative, uh, as Joanna has said, and there are, there are jobs to be had there at the moment if you go to jobs.ac.uk or the University of Cambridge's website. And I, I do think there's all sorts of possibilities for liaison and, uh, and co-working uh, with the Centre for Greek Studies. Uh, so we're, we're very much looking to support the Centre for Greek Studies. And so I'm delighted to be speaking for the Centre tonight. My talk tonight actually has a, a personal side to it because when I was an undergraduate uh, uh, in Cambridge, uh, I was a student at Downing College, which you see on the top left here. Well, in fact, you see it in both slides, but um, as was intended to be built on the top left, where I, I read English. And I must confess, I was partly attracted to go to Downing College by the architectural character of the place. So there's a little personal note to this tonight. And of course, also a Cambridge link to it as well, because little did I know when I went to Downing uh, back in the 1980s uh, that um, it belonged with the, the culture really of the university in the early years of the 19th century, uh, a time which we tend to think of in terms of uh, uh, Greekophilia, uh, and, and the Cambridge Greekophiles were in a sense European leaders in, in that regard. And Downing College itself was designed by William Wilkins from 1805, as you can see on the screen here. Now, and Wilkins had been a student of mathematics at Gonville and Keyes College here in Cambridge, then had been sent by the university with a prize to study in uh, Sicily and in, in Greece in the early years of the 19th century. And that effectively uh, made him into a, an architect uh, instead of a scholar of mathematics. Or well, perhaps the two things are not so far distanced one from the other. And the competition for Downing College uh, in 1805 has long been known to be a seminal or turning point in the history of the reception of Greek architecture of the Greek revival in both this country, the UK, but also in the wider world, because uh, it was at that point in time that Wilkins, who was in his 20s, supplanted the king's own architect, James Wyatt, who had held the commission for Downing since 1783, but not yet begun to build anything. And Wyatt's design, which you see in the lower image here, was a fairly standard sort of neo-Roman or rather Palladian building. Uh, and as I say, that design had been current for several decades, the lack of money holding it up. And this was a moment in time where also theory and the wishes of Cambridge patrons uh, came very much to the fore because in 1804, the dilettante and a man of letters, Thomas Hope, published a pamphlet entitled Observations on the Plans and Elevations Designed by James Wyatt for Downing College, Cambridge, a letter addressed to the incoming master of the college, which effectively, and rather improperly, I would suggest, uh, crit criticized uh, Wyatt's uh, neo-Roman designs and promoted the cause of uh, a neo-Greek architecture yet to come into existence. 
He does mention Wilkins in his pamphlet, not in connection with the Ionic order, which was to be used, the Erechtheon order to be used at Downing, but actually in connection with the Doric revival. But Hope's arguments are a mixture really of aesthetics, and so far as he um, talked about the, the importance of the straight line, uh, of kind of rationalism based on later 18th century philosophical ideas that Greek architecture reflected the host of lintel structure of architecture in its nat natural form, and that the pediments, for example, on the uh, temple-like uh, roofs of the design you see here for Downing uh, reflect the roof lines behind. But it was also a good dash of romanticism in Hope's arguments as well. Uh, he talks about the, the Romans as a degraded and warlike people, and the Greeks as peace-loving and the path not in particular as a temple to, to wisdom. Uh, so there's a kind of romantic, rational and aesthetic aspect to this uh, um, intervention in the course of British architecture and Downing College is at the centre of it. Now the story of Downing College, and maybe there are some of you here looking in from uh, overseas or perhaps elsewhere in the UK, might seem a rather provincial one up here in Cambridge. Uh, and indeed the building itself uh, was never actually completed in line with Wilkins's ambitions. You can see the image on the top there and you can see the corresponding view as it is today there. Uh, the building was begun uh, in 1807 or 1806, uh, but uh, not really completed until uh, 1820 or so. But I'm going to say that I think that is not uh, um, uh, in itself uh, uh, a, ma a major problem because Wilkins also designed uh, in 1805, 1806, the East India, now Haleybury College in Hertfordshire, uh, which was completed by 189. And forget the dome of the chapel here, this is a later intervention, but the, the hexastyle and the two tetrastyle porticos with the Erechtheon Ionic, uh, already by 1809, announced the arrival in public architecture for these colleges uh, of um, the, the Greek revival, and it's the Erechtheon Ionic that is being used. But many art historians and architecture historians would, I think, focus on the metropolis naturally uh, for the continuation of that story that was just perhaps begun at Cambridge and at Haleybury, and in particular on the uh, rebuilding of Covent Garden Theatre after a fire that took place very rapidly in 1808 to 1809. The architect was Robert Smirk, a near contemporary of William Wilkins's, and you see it here. It was subsequently destroyed in the fire in 1856, so we don't have the building anymore. And I defer here to uh, Joe Morden Crook in his still seminal, marvellous book, really, on the Greek revival, published in 1972, where he assures us that the building's Parthenon portico became one of the sites of the capital. It's Parthenon portico. And that rather made me think, because I don't know about you, but when I look at that portico, I don't particularly see or think of the Parthenon. It's a tetra-style Portico, it's applied to a building with no relation to the, the roof line behind and so forth. So I thought I'd look into that question a little bit. And as I said, we don't have the building, but we do fortunately, thanks to John Pritton and AC Pugin, have some um, plans and elevations and sections of Covent Garden Theatre. And it is the case that the columns here, these four Doric columns were very large indeed, the diameter at five foot six was just a little bit uh, less than the, the Parthenon, uh, as given in Stuart and Revit's Antiquities of Athens. Uh, the Covent Garden column heights, nearly 30 feet, just a little bit less than the Parthenon. Uh, and the Covent Garden intercolumniations were a bit wider than the Parthenon's maximum at the centres, uh, eight foot six. It's an entrance to a, uh, a theatre in London for big crowds of people rather than to a temple for priests and priestesses. But that does have the effect that the metopes up here do get somewhat distended into kind of uh, rectangular, rather more square profiles. So maybe it is true that the columns of Covent Garden reflected the, the Parthenon, and that was certainly how they were being received in the architectural press by the 1820s and 1830s. So Britain and Pugin, the people who gave us the measurements that I just looked at there, uh, say that the Temple of Minerva in the Acropolis, Athens, suggested the design for the portico of this edifice. And James Elms, in his Metropolitan Improvements of 1827, uh, asserts that the portico is tetra-style of the Athenian Doric order uh, after that of the Temple of Minerva Parthenon at Athens. So certainly by about 1830, uh, this building was being associated with uh, the Parthenon 
but that is 20 odd years after the building had been erected. And if we go back to what was actually happening at the time uh, it was erected, uh, we have the evidence of this uh, really truly awful poem uh, by a man called Lord Thurlow uh, to Robert Smirk Esquire on his beautiful building of Covent Garden Theatre. That's 1814. It starts with this uh, uh, wonderful line. When first I saw this fair and wondrous pile, a great example of the Doric style, and it goes on pretty much as bad as that for perhaps some several hundred lines. But I pick out two couplets from that poem later on to just give you here, uh, and they are these. So this hereafter to our eyes shall stand, the great Ephesian temple of our land. So the reference there is not to the Parthenon, but to the temple of Artemis at Ephesus, of course, one of the seven wonders of the ancient world. In other words, the Parthenon is not yet uh, on the same playing field, as it were, uh, with the great Ephesian temple that um, Thurlow talks about. And my last couplet there is where he goes on to say, as when Phidias his keen chisel swayed to carve the marble of the matchless maid. In other words, the interest there is actually in the sculptures of the Parthenon, in the uh, frieze and in the, the metopes, which of course, and the image bottom left shows you this here, uh, had been installed in the, the British Museum in London in this temporary room uh, in 1817 after their purchase by the British government from Elgin, of course, in 1816. And as I started to prepare this paper, looking around at some of the accounts written by travellers at the end of the 18th century, in the very early years of the 19th century, I did find it to be the case uh, that uh, it was the, the sculptures rather than the building uh, that were forefront in, in the mind of uh, tourists to Athens and writers of travelogues such as Moritz of Rokeby, uh, whose letters from the 1790s talk about uh, the Metope sculptures, saying nothing can exceed the variety and imagination of the attitudes or the brilliancy and exactness of the execution. Of the Parthenon as a building, he simply says, well, it's much on the plan of the temple of Theseus. And by that, what he means, of course, is the building that we now know as the Hephaestion, uh, but which for the period that we're talking about here was known as the Theseion. And I note that Robert Smirk himself, the architect of Covent Garden, when he was in Athens in the summer of 183, wrote back home to his family, the temple of Theseus cannot but arrest the attention of everyone from its appropriate and dignified solemnity of appearance. The temple of Minerva strikes one in the same way with its grandeur and majesty. So for Smirk, uh, in rank order as it were, uh, it was the Hephaestion uh, which struck him first and foremost. And if you know your history of early 19th century Athens, you'll know it was the Hephaestion uh, into which uh, John Tweddle, the Cambridge student who expired in the heats of uh, his strenuous uh, antiquarian activities in Rome, uh, and three or four other English travellers were buried, in fact, in the first years of the 19th century. Now, the Hephaestion, or Thysion, um, was already thought to be uh, the model used in one of the very earliest of all Greek revival buildings uh, in the Western world, the Temple of Theseus, so-called, at Hagley in Worcestershire, which was designed by James Athenian Stuart, he of the Antiquities of Athens, uh, in 1759, built in 1761. So the Temple of Theseus is what most architectural historians have known this building by, but it's been pointed out in relatively recent times, in fact, only in 2010, that Lord Littleton, who commissioned this building from Stuart in the 1750s and 1758, only described it as a true attic building, a portico of six pillars. In fact, it was Richard Pocock, another traveller who had been to uh, Athens and indeed published a book about uh, his travels in the East. Uh, in, in 1764, it was Pocock who characterised this as the front of the Temple of Theseus at Athens, not Littleton himself. Stuart obviously would have known what he was doing, he designed the building, but we've all assumed until Martin Golan's uh, expose in 2010, uh, that the source of this building was indeed the Hephaestion or Physeon uh, in Athens, when in actual fact, it was the Roman stoa uh, in the Agora in Athens, which had served as the example of the Doric order in the very first volume of Stuart and Rebecca's Antiquities of Athens in 17, 62. I won't go into details here except uh, to show Martin showed quite conclusively that the, the columns in their 
ratio of diameter to height were those of the, the stoa, portico, not of the Hephaestion, uh, and indeed the Echinus, uh, the capital, uh, was also that of the, of, of the stoa. We just hadn't looked closely enough. We'd always just assumed that it was the Hephaestion on the basis of that was a very romanticized monument, but uh, Martin established otherwise. And indeed, Stuart had simply uh, reduced the proportion of the, uh, the, the Greek, the building in Athens, the Roman building in Athens, uh, to, um, to, to seven inches to the foot for his building at Hagley. And this puts, him me, puts me in mind as well of uh, something that Martin didn't say, which was that he didn't comment that uh, at Hagley, Stuart also uh, brought together the wider central intercolumniation of the, uh, the stoa, uh, which of course was also a feature of the Propylaea uh, at Athens. And that was already serving as a model uh, in the 1780s and 1790s for Western uh, Greek revivalism, as you can see in the famous case of the Brandenburg Gate uh, there on the top left, and indeed as used by William Wilkins himself uh, for his proposed gateway or proper layer to Downing College, bottom left here, uh, modeled on his own study of the proper layer, which you see uh, uh, from his civil architecture of Vitruvius there on the bottom right, and not, not built at all. Today it's where the, the chemistry laboratories uh, stand. No, it isn't. It's where the Downing site begins, sorry, other end, the north of the site. So what I'm sort of getting at here is the idea that perhaps when we're looking at these very early examples of Greek revival buildings in country houses and in London, uh, including Covent Garden Theatre itself, we're looking less at a concerted revival or memorialization, shall we call it, of the Parthenon, and more at something that's more generically Doric in its, in its character. It's quite hard to say without going to the sort of level of detail that Martin Golan went to with the little building in Worcestershire, uh, just whether it's the Hephaestion or the Parthenon or indeed one of the other Doric temples uh, uh, were being um, um, measured and presented to the Western world that were the sources here. Uh, William Stark's courthouse in Glasgow, for example, one of the earliest appearances of uh, the Doric portico in uh, an urban setting after the Covent Garden Theatre, uh, looks to me more like the Hephaestion uh, than the Parthenon order, and certainly the scale of the columns is more in line with the, the smaller of the two temples in the Agora rather than the Parthenon on the Acropolis. George Dance at Stratton Park, similarly, 1803 to 1804, bottom left there, uh, is using one of the Pistum orders. And William Wilkins there at Osberton on the uh, lower right, with a column height of 23 feet for his tetra-style portico splits the difference almost precisely between the Hephaestion and the Parthenon. We know very well where the story of the Parthenon's rise to monumentality to almost hagi hagiographical status in the Western tradition comes from. It starts in Germany, doesn't it, with uh, Geely's uh, design for the monument to Frederick the Great of Prussia of the mid 1790s, this um, open um, Doric uh, temple on top of an Acropolis type of structure, uh, though I'm not sure when you look at the details of this, uh, indeed look at other drawings of this monument, that the column is that of the Parthenon, and of course there are only 12 columns in the flank, not the 17 of the, of, of the Great Temple on the Acropolis. Anna von Hallerstein, uh, C.R. Cockerell's companion and friend in much of his travels in, in Greece, is nearer to the mark with his on paper design for a Valhalla for Ludwig of Bavaria, this is 1814, uh, at one stage of the competition for the Valhalla, uh, where we have a much more uh, approximate uh, impression of the Parthenon, both in the uh, frontal elevation and the fact that Hala has the correct number of 17 columns in the flank. But of course, these things all stay on paper. And I can't resist, of course, our Cambridge intervention in this story with the extraordinary plan by William John Banks, one of the MPs for Cambridge, to demolish Gonville and Keyes College uh, William Wilkins would have been turning in his grave had he been in his grave at that point in time uh, to demolish Keyes College and replace it with a replica of the Parthenon to serve as the Fitzwilliam Museum. This is 1824. It's a preposterous idea, preposterous both in terms of the, the site and in terms of the impracticality of such a, a structure to serve uh, as a museum for the display of paintings. I think perhaps the first, perhaps the first construction where we can actually see the Parthenon clearly there 
uh, because of its octostar character, is probably right across the other side of the Atlantic, uh, in um, the case of William Strickland's Second Bank of the USA in Philadelphia, uh, built from 1818 to 1824, though, of course, whilst the front and rear porticos reflect the Parthenon's octostar character, the sides do not have peristyles. Strickland never travelled to Greece. He would have been working from Stuart and Rebex Antiquities of Athens. Uh, he was the pupil, however, of the English architect Benjamin Henry Latrobe, um, whose Baltimore Cathedral was perhaps one of the great monuments of uh, early Greek revivalism in the United States of America. It was begun in 1805, uh, but it's very striking to note that in 1818, the same year that Strickland was working on the bank in Philadelphia, Latrobe uh, changed the character of the capitals of his cathedral in Baltimore from his proposed Corinthian to the Erechtheion Ionic. Columns weren't actually built till much later in the 19th century, so we can't use that as an example, very early uh, Erechtheion um, architecture, but nonetheless the intent to do it was there, and quite why Latrobe made that change uh, is I think an interesting point to perhaps deliberate about. And then of course, here back in the UK, we have the uh, extraordinary scheme to place uh, a replica of the Parthenon, a facsimile of the Parthenon, as it was described by the commissioning committee, on top of Colton Hill in Edinburgh, the so-called Athens of the North, uh, an attempt to create a monument that would commemorate the service and fallen of the uh, Napoleonic Wars, both on sea and on battlefield. Uh, now, here the architect was Charles Robert Cockerell, the friend and companion, as I pointed out, of Halle von Hallerstein, uh, the great uh, German um, gentleman and architect. Uh, and um, Cockerell had to work with a local Edinburgh architect. Monuments began in 1825 at the bottom, had they never reached beyond the, uh, the front of the, um, of the Proneos. Now, many people think this is a uh, a, a fated project and that Cockerell's heart was not in it uh, to sort of replicate the Parthenon and of course by replication here we're talking only about the exterior of the building not about the interior which was in fact to serve as a church. But actually in my paper that Joanna Carney referred to about the real and the ideal in British Hellenomania I was able to to show there uh, that Cockerell actually uh, wrote to Playfair in 1826 saying it is not unreasonable to suppose you or I can ever be engaged in a nobler undertaking. And I think this is a, a sign both of the Parthenon's rise in the 1820s uh, to kind of preeminence as a monument, uh, but also uh, a sign that Cockerell thought that such a thing was worth doing perhaps once, but certainly worth doing. And in connection with his uh, design for the facsimile of the Parthenon, Cockerell actually produced in manuscript a theoretical account of Greek architectural design, unpublished uh, today, something I'd like to do more on uh, later on. He, that's dated uh, in 1823. I'll mention that again a little bit later on. And then finally, of course, we reached the, the full sort of climax of the Parthenon's rise to, uh, to mythical status, really, with um, uh, the uh, uh, arrival of Otto as king of Athens and the 1834 memorandum by Leo von Klenza, the Bavarian architect arguing for the restoration of the Acropolis and placing in order Parthenon, Erechtheion, Propylaea, giving them that kind of hierarchical order and inviting um, Otto uh, on the Acropolis there to consecrate the first piece of column to be erected on the rejuvenated Parthenon, so that as Cleanser put it, the remains of a glorious past will arise in new splendour as the surest stanchion of a glorious present and future. And Mary Beard has written in her book on the Parthenon uh, about this kind of key moment in the Parthenon's rise from uh, ruin to uh, monument par excellence. We know the story, I don't need to delay on it, but we also have numerous and very good books dealing with this uh, uh, character of the Parthenon within the Romantic period. Uh, there's uh, Panos Tournikiotis's Parthenon and its impact in modern times of 1994 and Mary Beard's book I mentioned there, and also Jennifer Neal's Parthenon from Antiquity to the Present. Great swathe of books that have come out that deal with the history of the Parthenon, in particular its modern reception. Now, to the best of my knowledge, and I'm happy to be corrected on this, I don't think there's any equivalent book on the Erechtheion uh, that, that charts its, uh, its rise really from 
uh, ruin in the 18th century to the kind of paradigmatic building that I'm trying to suggest in this talk uh, it, it became in the early years of the 19th century and perhaps in some ways has, has stayed. I stand to be corrected, but I don't think that's the case. Certainly it's the case that before any recognizable Parthenon uh, replica or Parthenon inspired modern building was really being erected, the Erechtheon was absolutely recognizably being reused. At Downing College, as we've uh, already seen at the start of my talk, uh, Wilkins, as you can see here on the right, has taken the order uh, directly from the east portico of the Erechtheon, though he's omitted this uh, bead and reel molding of the uh, Erechtheon uh, for a plain uh, molding there, which he's taken from the north portico, in fact. He's also omitted the egg and dart uh, echinus decoration that you get in all three of the orders of the Erechtheon, there it is missing there. I might also say that whilst he's picked up the overlapping fascias of the architrave, he's also omitted the enrichment of the top level of the architrave there, indeed a bit of the cornice above as well. This question about why some of these enrichments are present and not present is an interesting one I'd like to come back to uh, perhaps at a later stage, not, not tonight, though economy may well have something to do with it. And then, sorry about the quality of the slide on the left here, it's uh, not what I've been able to retake because I can't get into Downing College at the moment, but the base of the columns at Downing again is uh, following the order of the, the east and indeed the west porticos of the of the uh, Erechtheon because uh, the north portico uh, has the upper torus of the base, this is part here at Downing and here at the Erechtheon uh, plaited uh, with, rather than filleted with its decoration. And then Wilkins even took the very distinctive, perhaps even unique feature of the double anta uh, here on the northwest corner of the Erechtheon and used it on the southwest corner of the hall at Downing College there to negotiate this slightly difficult turn uh, where he was also changing materials from the Ketton stone that was facing as it were the gardens and the public face of the college to the cement rendered brick wall uh, facing to the, the west there. And he's used that double anter uh, that you see there at the Erechtheon, a distinctive feature. So absolutely clearly Downing College is a, uh, uh, a reimagining of the Erechtheon for modern purposes in the earliest years of the 19th century. And if you're still thinking that's a rather provincial case because it's, it's Cambridge after all, then let's rem remind ourselves that one of the most famous of all buildings put up in the Regency period was the Great Church of St Pancras just outside today's Euston Station in London by William and Henry William Inwood. Uh, who won the competition to design this great church in 1818 and built it from 1819 to 1822. Now there's the design with which they won the competition on the top left there. Uh, William was the father, Henry William was the son. Might just make the point that if you've got eagle eyes, you might see that the porch over here on the left of the image actually doesn't uh, in this drawing have the carotids, uh, which would eventually appear on the building, both in fact on the north and the south sides. This is partly a reflection of the fact that after winning the competition with a design clearly modelled on the Erechtheon, uh, William sent his son Henry William to Athens to study the, the monument itself, the temple itself, uh, and uh, as a result of that uh, Inwood came back not only uh, with the idea of uh, incorporating the, the carotid porches for the vestries of the church, uh, but also indeed with casts of the doorway from the north portico, which enables him to produce the exquisitely detailed uh, west door of St Pancras Church here. And indeed, even some fragments of uh, the east doorway of the Rechtham were brought back by Inwood as well. And I've quoted here from Britain and Pugin's illustration of public buildings just to, to stress the, um, the, the public excitement and, uh, and notoriety uh, that this building achieved and how Britain and Bugin in their account of it felt obliged to not just to give an account of the, of, the, of the church itself, but also a short account of the ancient Athenian temples that suggested the form, the arrangement, and the general enrichment of the edifice now to be illustrated. So no doubt was left both about the, the source and indeed about the, uh, and, and about the qualities of the building, its form, its arrangement, and its general enrichment. Well, Inward, not only modeled his church uh, on the Erechtheon, but went on some years later in 1827 to publish a major monograph on the building, 
uh, based on his researches in 1818 to 1819. It's not a full monograph, it's not a full survey such as we might expect a modern archaeological survey to achieve because it would make it clear he was building on the work of Stuart and Revit and adding to what they had done. But nonetheless, uh, his book, uh, which was produced in the second edition, 1831, and was translated into German in 1843, quite significantly, I think, his book presented the usual uh, uh, elevation views of the ruin in its current state, his perspective restoration of how he thought it would have been, but also a lot of details uh, on the mouldings to enable modern day architects to build very precisely, uh, in this case, the column bases. And there's the platted molding of the North Portico's base that I mentioned a minute or two ago. By this point in time, Stuart and Revet's study of the Parthenon was still the major uh, study in uh, the English language, and that had come out uh, in 1790. Uh, so here we are in 1827 with a significant study of the Erechtheon, and nor was this the only study of the Erechtheon published at this time by English architects. William Wilkins himself, uh, in 1816, uh, produced his little book, Athenientia. You see the title page of here on the top left. It deals with the monuments of Athens and of the Acropolis in general, uh, but the only illustration uh, in the book is this one here, a little perspective view of the Erechtheon as restored, not the Parthenon, not the Propylaea, uh, but the Erechtheon. And Wilkins writes in Athenientia, there's no difficulty in recognizing in this beautiful edifice, the Erechtheum of Pausanias. Now he intended, he says at the end of Athenientia, Wilkins, to go on to write a subsequent history of the Erechtheum. He doesn't do that, in fact, for another uh, nearly three decades. It doesn't uh, come out, his book, Prolusiones Architectonica, until 1837. But when it does come out, just two years before his own death, actually, of 128 pages, the first 82 are about the Erechtheon, and it includes 14 new plates, and indeed a, a detailed account of the marble stele uh, of 409 BC, which is such an important document for us for understanding the construction history of the Erechtheon today. So I quoted from Athenientia there uh, how uh, uh, it was very clear to um, Wilkins that uh, the remains of the Erechtheon were indeed the beautiful edifice as described by Pausanias. And Wilkins also says this, the columns had a sculptured necking, which is observed in no other known instance of the Ionic order. The volutes are beautiful in design and most exquisitely wrought. Whereas the Parthenon, he says, was in former times the pride of Athens and the boast of architecture. And he reflects on the Parthenon in former times being the pride of Athens, but the Erechtheon has columns which are beautiful in design and exquisitely wrought. And all this publication on the Erechtheon, as I say, is coming out before, uh, I suppose 1851 is the key date when Francis Cranmer Penrose produces his investigation into the principles of Athenian architecture, his great study of the Parthenon. But the Erechtheon is there in a sense first. And I've it italicized the words beautiful uh, in this uh, slide uh, myself, not Wilkins, but myself, because I want to now uh, just really, uh, in the second part of my talk, just make some reflections really on, on why um, it seems to be the Erechtheon that provided such a paradigm uh, so early in the 19th century Greek revival. And the first, and I suppose really the principal reason for it, I think is to do with this concept of, of beauty, actually. Uh, so uh, it's a, a truism really in connection with the uh, Erechtheon that travelers to it found it beautiful. I mentioned Richard Pocock earlier on, the man who mistook the uh, little temple at Hagley for the Hephaestion, when it was really the Stoa from the Agora. Um, Pocock, uh, in his uh, 1745 book of the Erechtheon, speaks of it as a very beautiful Ionic order, whereas he calls the Parthenon plain, and was surprised, he says, that the Greeks had not embellished uh, the Parthenon in the finest manner with other more beautiful orders. Julien David Le Roy, uh, rival of Stuart and Revet, an author of Les Ruines des plus beaux monuments de la Grèce, uh, in 1758, second edition in 1770, also says, undoubtedly, the most interesting feature of the Erechtheon building is its capital, to my mind, an extremely beautiful one. And Moret of Rokeby, who I quoted earlier on on the, uh, on the Hephaestion of the Erechtheon, says, I never saw the Ionic order more beautiful 
and begin really to think that the ancient Grecians were inspired by some genius of elegance and taste, the since given over business, for we do not make any more of these kinds of miracles now. Now, the Erechtheion, of course, was not the first of these uh, very embellished Ionic capitals. We do find them elsewhere now. We know them, for example, from the Temple of Locri in, in South Italy, South East Italy. But these examples were not known at the time. It was the Erechtheion that stood as the uh, as the example, exemplar of beauty, both in the enrichment of the order itself and its mouldings, and of course also in its extraordinary frieze of palmettes and what were then called lotus decorations, we probably would call them honeysuckle today. James Athenian Stewart, I'll come to in just a, a moment, but before we do, let me also remind us, perhaps we need to just remind ourselves, uh, that Elgin's uh, pillaging of the Acropolis did not just involve the Parthenon, but also the Erechtheion. Uh, he brought back to London and, uh, and to uh, the, the, the English uh, audience the um, uh, northern column of the East Portico, which you see the capital of there on the top left, and also, of course, one of the Caritids. Uh, both of them were purchased by the British Museum in 1816. And I quote here, uh, from the newspaper, the Morning Chronicle of 1814. It's an advertisement for, as you can see, uh, a headdress based on the volutes of the Erechtheon order. And it's addressed to the nobility, gentry, and fashionable world. Ross's newly invented Grecian volute headdress, formed from the true marble models brought into this country from the Acropolis Athens by Lord Elgin. So there was a fashion for uh, Greek uh, design uh, following on from the uh, enthusiasm, of course, for the sculptures that we see recommended also in poems like John Keats's uh, sonnet on seeing the Elgin marbles, or indeed his own on the Grecian urn. The fashion really was for a more delicate kind of decoration, like this, no doubt, preposterous volute headdress uh, that Messrs. Ross were uh, advertising in the newspaper in 1814. Now, Stuart, who I mentioned a moment ago, uh, is, is not uh, lyrical. Uh, in his account of the monuments of Athens in the antiquities of Athens. He was distinctly trying to be objective and quasi-scientific, uh, sort of pretty typically archaeological one might almost say. It's Le Croix who tries to construct a history and an aesthetic around Greek architecture. Uh, and yet nonetheless, uh, Stuart uh, includes himself uh, here on the bottom right of this gouache image of the Erechtheion, actually making the very uh, drawing, perspective drawing of the monument, which will become the introductory plate to the Erechtheion in the Antiquities of Athens. Stuart and Revit both included themselves just in one of these uh, uh, illustrations, and they included both themselves in their um, illustration of the monument of Philippapus, uh, but they were not uh, drawing, not actively measuring there or, or studying the monuments, they were having coffee, in fact. Whereas here, uh, Stuart is actually making the measurement of the Erechtheion, which perhaps is a good sign that he valued this temple very highly. And indeed, if we work through his uh, unpublished papers in the RIBA Drawings Collection in the British Library, there are numerous studies of the volutes, in particular, of the Erechtheion uh, East Portico, one example of which I show you on the screen here now. It seems to have been his preferred uh, um, Greek order. And Stuart very quickly began using the Erechtheion's decorative forms in his neoclassical decoration once back in England. Here is part of the uh, cornice uh, of uh, Lady Spencer's dressing room in Spencer House in London, which Stuart designed in the late 1750s and early 1760s using the palmet and honeysuckle motif there. I think that's taken from the capital or the anter of the North Portico. Uh, and he's using the same motif actually in the painted room down here. You can't see it in quite such detail there, but I show you that whole room just to make the point that these images started arriving back in the West just at the moment at which the kind of Neo-Palladian neoclassicism of uh, the previous decades, which can be exemplified here by this uh, drawing room at Holcomb Hall in Norfolk, completed in the 1750s, was giving way with its quite heavy, and uh, uh, high relief uh, friezes taken from Degaudet's Edifice Antique de Rome was giving way to the much more uh, light um, and, uh, uh, and uh, well, yes, light is the word we should use, uh, light and effervescent 
decoration of Stuart and of his great rival, Robert Adam, whose anteroom at Zion, I show you this detail of in this Alamy photograph here on the left, rather livid in color, I have to say, that, uh, that uh, bright greeny blue, it's bluer than it seems in this image. But we see here quite nicely the, 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 the capital, the ironic capital here. And you can see that Adam is not a person who's going to cite directly from the Erechtheon, but is going to adapt it. And this is the period of time when architects like Adam were effectively anatomizing the classical vocabulary of architecture, as you see here in this plate of the Ionic orders from Adam's publication, the works in architecture of he and his brother of 1773, picking things apart, changing everything, eclectically gathering things back together, recombining them. This is the mood of the moment, but less for James Stewart, who in his frontispiece for Litchfield House, designed for Thomas Hanson of Shugborough and built in the 1760s, Shugborough another Locus Classicus for Stuart's little garden buildings and Greek revivals, there's a Doric portico there as well. Stuart took obsessive interest in getting the capitals of the erect film uh, right here for this St. James's Square frontispiece. We've got his letters to the client, Anson, and he says things like, I do for the honor of Athens, interest my, myself very much in the capitals. Indeed, he couldn't even leave London uh, until uh, one of the capitals was, was finished. They must not murder my capitals, the greatest grace and ornament of the building, he writes. And finally, on the completion of the frontispiece of this house, he says, I knew they would be nearly the same size with the originals, but was not aware that there is not a hair's breadth of difference in their diameters. So the pleasure there is in precision, precise replication of the Erechtheon order in the mid 1760s. And we find that order gently starting to recur in British um, neoclassical design in the second half of the last third of the, of the 18th century. But most fascinatingly, it appears, it bursts out here at Ashdown House in Sussex, which is one of the English works of Benjamin Latrobe before he emigrated to the States, taught Strickland, and as you saw earlier on, converted his Baltimore Cathedral from the Corinthian to the Erechtheon Ionic Order. Now here at Ashdown, uh, Latrobe was rebuilding the house and he put on this uh, circular or semi-circular portico with a circular uh, um, uh, uh, space behind it, a kind of garden room, like a tholos really. And he put on this portico uh, with the Erechtheon Ionic Order. But he didn't just do that, he actually had the capitals made by Eleanor Code, the remarkable woman enterprising business person um, who uh, produced the cementitious uh, um, mass producible uh, versions of classical elements for buildings, codestone capitals. Now, uh, Mrs. Code made at least eight ionic versions of the capital, uh, which you could, you could buy from her catalogue. Um, there were no Doric capitals at all that she was making an issue, which tells you something about taste in the last decade of the 19th century. But for Ashdown, Latrobe made her make a bespoke capital that included the necking as well. And he didn't just use it on the exterior, he also used it on the anti uh, inside the, the recession, recession, uh, recession there of the portico. So rather remarkable thing. So beauty, um, clearly a sort of truism in the later 18th century, but what about his alter ego? in 18th century aesthetics, the sublime. We're thinking here of Edmund Burke's philosophical inquiry into our ideas of the beautiful and the sublime. And there's no doubt, I think, that the idea of sublimity as Burke defined it uh, was being applied to Greek Doric architecture before the century was out. We see it best of all, perhaps, in Goethe, uh, in his visit to Paestum in 1787, where he talks about the temples, and I'm showing you here, of course, the temple of Hera one, the first temple of Hera. He talks about the temples at first sight, exciting nothing but stupefaction. I found myself, says Goethe, in a world which was completely strange to me, our eyes, and through them our whole sensibility had become so conditioned to a more slender style of architecture that these crowded masses of stumpy conical columns appear offensive and even terrifying. That's a true expression, I think, of the, the sublime associated with Paestum. But of course, the Temple of Hero One is indeed, of course, a more primitive example of the Doric, Doric and appears so to us than 
the work of Berkeley and Athens in the fifth century BC. How was the Parthenon received? Was it received as sublime? And it's important to remember here, of course, that by the early years of the 19th century, as Robert Smirk himself, the architect of Covent Garden Theatre, would put it, uh, the Parthenon was little more than a heap of ruins after the demolitions of the Turks and Lord Elgin. And there's Smirk's little view of the Parthenon, showing it, of course, as it was in the first years of the 19th century, before the clearances of the 1830s onwards, hemmed in by um, all the little houses uh, and, uh, and detritus of the occupation of the Ottoman authorities. Now, I haven't got time in my talk tonight, we're running out of time anyway, to go into this in much detail, but I think there will be room when I do more work on this, perhaps others of you can comment on this, there will be room for quite a bit of interesting uh, research on the extent to which or when the path or how the path form indeed came to be seen as, uh, as sublime. Um, I'll first of all, defer to the Earl of Aberdeen, another Cambridge educated Greekophile, who was asked by his near contemporary William Wilkins in 1812 to write an introductory preface to Wilkins's translation of Vitruvius, uh, a, a treatise or a text that uh, Aberdeen published anonymously, but then published under his own name in 1822 with some alterations. And I find in that a key sort of statement of early 19th century English aesthetics that Aberdeen uh, thought of the Parthenon as, as he put it quite explicitly, the most beautiful, perhaps, of the buildings of antiquity. Beautiful. And he induced the Parthenon to counter Burke's defining principles of beauty and effectively denounced them as fundamentally female in character, uh, as though the male could not be beautiful, Doric could not be beautiful. And linked to that, Aberdeen goes on to deny uh, Burke's argument that magnitude or uh, excessive or uh, uh, extensive repetition uh, amounted to a sublimity uh, in the perception of, uh, of buildings. He, he, dis he dismisses that altogether, instead attributing sublimity to that quality, as he puts it, rather nebulously, which most powerfully excites ideas of the superior force and energy necessary for the accomplishment of the work. So for Aberdeen, it's really not the visual quality, but the making, the imp impression of the making of it, the manufacture of it. And this is where I think his ideas of 1812, 1822, linked to Cockerell's unpublished treatise on uh, uh, Greek architectural theory and Greek architectural design, which is much more based on elements like um, site, choice of site, uh, uh, brilliance of manufacture. And this is the time, of course, when the optical refinements, the curvatures of Greek architecture are all being discovered and, and recognized and rationalized to an audience who previously thought of rectilinearity as early as, well, just as recently as 1804 with Hope's um, letter about Downing College, where straight lines was the, was the aesthetic that was prized in Greek architecture. It was all changing by the 1820s. Uh, so Aberdeen doesn't really deal with the uh, sublime in, in relation to the Greek Doric or, or the Parthenon. He just regards it as beautiful, uh, but not beautiful in a female way, beautiful in a male way. But there is room, I think, for manoeuvre around that idea. Uh, Inwood, in his book on the uh, Erechtheon, as you see, 1827, uh, talks about the building as the noblest effort of genius, possessing without the aid of magnitude the most intrinsic beauty of any instance of Athenian architecture. Now the Parthenon, ranging not far distant by the side of the Erechtheon, the beauty and character of each can be distinguished. The former, that's to say uh, the Parthenon, may be thought to possess harmony and sublimity in a high degree, but without elegance or richness. So I think Inward is still trying to, to, to work between these two poles of the beautiful and the sublime. The, the Parthenon does have sublimity, but it comes at the cost of elegance and richness, uh, which uh, the Erechtheon possesses. As I say, that's a topic perhaps to come back to on another occasion when more research has been done. But I just want to touch briefly as I come to a conclusion now about two other aspects of the Erechtheon in addition to beauty, which I think made it such a paradigmatic force in the first two decades of the 19th century. And the first of those two, last points I want to make is about flexibility. It's quite well known that Vitruvius, in addition to, of course, completely misunderstanding the mythical origins of the, the carotid 
porch, um, also comments on the uh, Erechtheion with some horror, perhaps, that um, all that we regularly find in the fronts of temples, porticos, order, symmetria, as you would put it, is here transferred to the sides. So it's the idea that porticos don't just appear on the front, as here with the east portico of the Erechtheion, but have also been moved uh, to the side, as in the north portico, and of course on the south side with the uh, carotid porch as well. So this idea of asymmetry, indeed of different ground levels as well, uh, is a very appealing aspect of the, prop of, of the Erechtheon. It's true of the proper layer as well, of course, but that was in less good condition even than the Erechtheon uh, in the early years of the 19th century. And the Erechtheon was focused on for this, this quality of, 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 of asymmetry. When I was teaching in a school of architecture, I found very attractive the argument of uh, the arch architect and historian Bruce Alsop uh, that the Erechtheon uh, was in some ways a kind of a, a response uh, in terms of its design to the perfection of the Parthenon. Also thought the Erechtheon was begun just 10 years after the Parthenon was completed. And he says in 1970, to have designed a mini Parthenon, the Doric order would have been trite indeed. And I suggest this juxtaposition of a small, exquisite, asymmetrical, highly ornamented Ionic shrine to the ponderous, dignified austere mass of the Parthenon is one of the most successful relationships of two buildings which has ever been achieved. Well, I say I found that a very attractive idea, but of course it won't do, uh, will it? it uh, we, we now, I think, must understand the Erechtheon's complexities of levels uh, and of the different uh, forms of the building as a response to, the, to the, the site itself and, of course, to the clusters of, um, of um, deities uh, to whom uh, the building was in its various uh, aspects dedicated. Um, it's a response to that, I think, not to some sort of modernist idea of, well, look, the Parthenon's a fantastic, perfect example of a peripheral temple, what do we do next? Something completely different. Uh, I also think that uh, the conception of the Parthenon as austere is as modernist a view uh, as uh, Allsop's view on the asymmetries of the Parthenon. I don't think in the 18th and 19th centuries, the Parthenon was regarded as austere. But that asymmetry, that flexibility that the Erechtheon suggested was certainly uh, mined by architects in the early 19th century, because after all, the peripheral temple can only serve a rather limited number of functions. Whereas with the Erechtheon, you can, as at Downing, have porches both on the side to the garden uh, and on the front to the quadrangle there. Uh, Parche, what Thomas Hope would have said about the fact that this portico or pediment here does not reflect a roof line behind properly. You can have the porches on the Church of St Pancras, uh, canted off to the sides there. Now, Inwood, in his 1827 study of the Erechtheon, actually provided 14, no fewer than 14 precepts that he thought the Erechtheon provided, from which it can be deduced, he says, the knowledge of ancient architecture. And the very second of those precepts was that there were porticos attached to the sides of the cellars. Once we move outside of the Ionic order, we find that same idea of attaching things to the sides, flexibility with the plan, adapting the plan to the needs of the building, uh, being transferred into the Doric order by Wilkins here at Grange Park in uh, Hampshire, where you've got the Karaji monument of Thrasyllus appearing on the side of the building with the Hephaestion portico on the front. Here in Edinburgh, uh, William Henry Playfair with the Surgeon's Hall of 1829, also a T-shaped plan for the building. Not the Erechtheon Ionic here, the Ionic order, but you see how the Ionic is now being associated with a very enriched frieze of palmettes and indeed beautifully um, carved decorative, not figurative, pediment uh, sculptures. Similarly, characterising Playfair's earlier Royal Institution in Edinburgh, uh, now the Scottish Academy, there's the enriched pediment, and although this is a Doric building with the uh, side elements, you also see the Erechtheon uh, or the Ionic uh, enrichment running through in this frieze uh, drop down uh, below the level of the entablature. Inwood's list of the Erechtheon's precepts also include the idea of a colonnade raised on a basement. In other words, Greek architecture didn't have to just stand on the, on the stylobate, on the crepis, but could actually, as in the Palladian language of architecture, actually be set on the piano nobile, put up in the air, as in the uh, west portico of the Erechtheon that you see in the slide there, and indeed as Stuart had used it 
at Litchfield House in St James's Square several decades before. It's that use that William Wilkins himself made of introducing the Erecte on Order to London itself in his United University Club of 1822, which he worked on with J.P. Gandhi. Clearly based, said John Britton, on the Triple Temple to Athens, adapted and applied to novel situations. We've not just got the Erecte on Order here, but the freeze as well, in fact. And the Erechtheon provided uh, the instance of the, um, of the engaged column in Greek architecture as well on the west portico, enabling inward at St. Pancras Church to handle the transition from the freestanding portico uh, down the sides here with the engaged uh, columns to the, the wall beyond. Now, the previous prototypes for the the church structure with the portico on the front is actually used, as in the case of James Gibbs and Martin Fields, as you can see, uh, additional columns to achieve that. But the Greek architecture of the Erechtheon offered the precedent of engaged columns. Indeed, the wall at all uh, was something which the Erechtheon offered, as opposed to a peristyle of columns that could be used in modern architectural design, as Inwood does so well here at St Pancras Church. And my final little comment, therefore, linked to flexibility is practicality. Because the Erechtheon, of course, is one of the few buildings of the ancient world and the Greek world that actually had windows, which are, of course, needed uh, in modern architecture, particularly in northern climes. So there's Stuart and Revet's uh, interior elevation of the west front of the Erechtheon with the three windows. And indeed, Inwood's first precept, what we could learn from the Erechtheon, was indeed its demonstration of windows within the context of a pro style temples. He mentions that the ancients lit their temples by windows in several instances, but he couldn't cite any other Greek example uh, than the Erechtheon. This approach to practicality led to a number of studies in the 1820s and 30s, like Thomas Leverton's Donaldson's book on doorways, that tried to look at how ancient examples could serve modern purposes. And there is Donaldson's um, elevation of the northern door of the Erechtheon. And from doors, you fairly quickly get on to discussions, discussions of how windows can be designed when they're not in the same scale as those of the Erechtheon, uh, when they are reduced uh, according to Vitruvian precepts, as here at St Pancras Church to serve as the small windows underneath the galleries, but giving light to those worthy uh, parishioners of St Pancras to read their prayer books by, or here in this little attic window for the bedroom of the master of Downing College in Cambridge. Well, by the 1820s and into the 1830s, we find the Erechtheon Ionic, such a recognizable uh, idiom, being widely used for European buildings, uh, most uh, impressively here in Germany and in, in, in Prussia, uh, by uh, Schinkel for the Schauspielhaus in Berlin. Again, another building which shows that same flexibility of plan that I've been talking about. Um, but has the Erechtheon order, or the Altus Museum, also the Erechtheon order. And there in Paris, uh, with Jacques Narcitoff's Saint Vincent de Paul of 1830 onwards, again, clearly an Erechtheon order. But I want to conclude by coming back to Cambridge in my last slide of, of Downing College, where I started, um, with I think the serendipitous appearance of the, uh, the west front of the hall at Downing College which I'm comparing here uh, with a plate from William Wilkins's Prolusiones Architectonicae, a sectional drawing of the west side of the Erechtheon, designed by or drawn by Wilkins to show the position as he took it of the sacred olive tree, the sacred tree that of course survived the, the, the fire of the Persian sacking of the original Erechtheon uh, temples, uh, and which was such an important um, aspect of Greek religious life, the place supposedly where Athena struck the ground of the Acropolis, having defeated Poseidon at the battle for the city of Athens, and the supposed burial place of Cecrops and Erechtheus himself. Now, I don't know who laid out uh, the grounds at Downing College in the 1960s, when Bill Howell and Killick and Partridge Namis uh, rebuilt this, uh, uh, the kitchens and the senior combination at Downing, but whoever did so, either knew or by serendipity came upon the idea of placing this shrub, which is not an olive tree, sad to say, uh, but a magnolia um, in exactly the, or more or less exactly the right position uh, 
from where Wilkins, the architect of this building, uh, would have had the sacred olive tree of the Acropolis in Athens. Joanna, I shall stop there. I think I've tried people's patience long enough, but um, I hope some food for thought there. Early thoughts, as I've said, uh, but very willing to take uh, questions if I can answer them or to, to hear observations and comments. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Frank. This was very, it was a very rich, informative and detailed talk. And it is definitely true that I will never look at Downing College the same way again. Uh, can we please uh, take questions now? I would be grateful if you could drop a very quick line on the chat uh, box uh, so that I get your name and title correctly. Uh, if you can just indicate with uh, the Q letter that you have a question for for Frank, then I can immediately give you um, a team I can see, uh, Professor Whitmarsh, team. <laughs> uh, thanks, Frank. That was, uh, that was fascinating, absolutely fascinating. And um, I'm sure for many of us was, you know, really genuinely eye-opening. If you don't have an architect's eye for these things, you just don't spot them. Um, I wanted to ask about caryatids, which I guess is a sort of obvious question, really. I and mean, they're the most, I suppose for us now, I mean, Maybe we need to retrain our eyes, but for us now, they are the most iconic um, elements of the Eric Theon. Uh, there are caryatids on St. Pancras Church, um, but I didn't see any other caryatids. So I wondered whether, you know, that was something that was being screened out, whether they were looking at the Eric Theon with different eyes or just not noticing them, or whether, as I say, this sort of the, um, I don't know, this sort of pick and mix approach that they seem to have where, you know, capitals really matter. And uh, as you say, sort of asymmetrical design and then going around corners and all that sort of stuff. That's what they were really excited about. Yeah. Thank you, Tim. It's a very good question. The fault is mine, actually. I meant to issue a disclaimer when I was talking about the, the, the caryatids. Um, no, uh, they, they are very important. Um, the reason I didn't go into detail, I meant to say during the talk, is that in a sense, it's almost a different, um, almost different discourse uh, because of the kind of, uh, you know, human figurative sort of nature of, of, of the caryatids. Um, they were extremely popular, um, and Mrs. Code uh, made a version of them. Uh, John Soane, for example, uh, is thought to have bought, I think, over three dozen of them. He, he used them liberally inside his Bank of England interior on his own house at uh, Pitts Hanger and Needle Lincoln's in Fields. You can still see them up on the top of the front there. So they were very popular. Uh, it is a slightly different discourse because of the whole kind of anthropomorphic idea and the whole gender idea. I didn't particularly want to, to deal with that in detail today, but I should have mentioned it. Uh, the other thing I would just say is that there has been a lot of work done on the caryatids, uh, as I'm trying to talk about something which I think is perhaps slightly less well known. And, and some of that work has been done in, indeed in the Cambridge context, because uh, one of my own PhD students, uh, Max Bryant, uh, wrote his PhD about sculpture and, and cockerels viewed sculpture and dealt with the caryatids there. And we also have at the moment in um, the Department of History of Art, in fact, uh, Kieran O'Neill, who did his whole dissertation at York University on the reception of caryatids in the uh, 18th century and 19th century period. So yeah, there's a lot to do there, Tim. Um, uh, and I, uh, I, I did admit it, and I should have said I was doing so, and I should have said why I was doing so. Uh, thank you, Frank. Uh, there is a question by Maureen Alden, if I'm pronouncing the name correctly. I'm, I've been having a lot of trouble with names uh, tonight. Uh, the question is, uh, uh, if you can, uh, if you could uh, expand a little bit more, Frank, about Mrs. Uh, Code and her work, uh, if you can give a little bit more information. Yeah, well, Maureen, there's a very good book on um, Eleanor Code published by a lady called Alison Kelly. I happen to notice it's available for $9.99 on Amazon, but don't buy it too soon because I would like to pick it up myself at some point. But no doubt there's another one there as well. Yeah, uh, well, I, you know, it's a, it's a different story in a sense, but a formidable enterprising businesswoman um, who, who saw the opportunity really uh, uh, on the back, I suppose, of, of industrialization uh, to acquire uh, somebody else's business making sort of ceramic uh, elements of buildings that could be bought off the shelf much more cheaply therefore than having them hand carved as would have been the case up to the 18th century. And she set up a business, she took over from a man who was failing uh, and, and ran it uh, for the rest of the 18th century. Uh, she published the catalogue in 1784 uh, with I think over 700 items that you could buy. She made etchings to show visually what the things looked like and many, many um, aspects of neoclassical architecture uh, 
and later 18th century in this country uh, draw on codestone uh, details um, for them. Uh, it was incredibly, uh, incredibly um, uh, fertile uh, business that she, she ran, it was taken on after her death by a man called Crogan uh, and ran right through to, I think, 1830, 1840, something like that, when the, when the mass production of building elements was replaced by, by iron, uh, as in railway stations and things, rather than by this uh, codestone cementitious material. Like all good recipes, it's a bit of a mystery as to what it was, uh, but by word, it's um, durable because they're still there as fresh as the day they were made. Thank you very much, uh, Frank. Any more questions? I can see one more question by Elizabeth Macaulay Lewis. Um, are there any examples of a mausolea that use the Erechtheon columns and capitals? Uh, we have them in uh, Woodlawn Cemetery in New York City. Yeah, um, good question. Um, I can't think off the top of my head of one, but I'm sure there are some. Um, perhaps the monument to Huskisson in Liverpool, um, the man, the, the Minister of State who was killed by Stevenson's rocket uh, when he underestimated the speed of it. I think that might be an Erechtheon Warden of Mausoleum. Sorry, Elizabeth, I didn't do a kind of trawl around everything in the 1820s, 30s onwards. I really wanted to talk about the first two decades of the century, uh, but uh, I'm sure there will be examples. And, and of course, as you're pointing out, um, it's, it's there in the States. And the Woodlawn example you're citing is possibly earlier than the Erechtheon order actually appears at Baltimore Cathedral, because that wasn't executed until the 1860s. But yes, I'm sure there are. Thank you, Frank. Any more questions? No? Okay. Well, um... In this case, then perhaps uh, we should uh, thank Frank for uh, this very exciting uh, talk. Uh, as I said, he, he gave us very rich uh, details and we will be looking at things uh, surrounding us in, <laughs> in, a, in a different way from now on. Um, so thank you very much for this, uh, Frank. It, it was a pleasure. Unfortunately, we won't see uh, each other for the usual customary drink, given the circumstances but we live in hope that uh, soon enough we will be able to do that. Once again, I would very much like to thank Frank uh, for stepping in and uh, giving this talk uh, tonight. And of course, to all of you for being with us. Okay, then um, have a lovely evening um, and see you soon. Take care, bye-bye. <laughs>